Hello. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining our roundtable today to discuss new climate narratives. I'm Lydia Dean Pilcher, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the Producers Guild of America, along with my PGA Green colleagues, Mary Jo Winkler, Katie Carpenter, and Shanti Olsies Brook. We've been promoting sustainability and filmmaking for a lot of years and a longstanding collaboration with the Studio Production Alliance, which now includes 11 major studios and production company partners. Our joint initiative, greenproductionguide.com, offers resources and tools to calculate carbon emissions on TV film sets. And since COVID-19, the, since the pandemic began, we've been increasingly aware that our lives are undergoing seismic change and that we're not returning to the old normal. We feel, as we hope many of you do as well, that if we want a healthier, safer, and more just world, it's up to us to imagine it and create it. We feel COVID-19 and climate change share causes and consequences that are a result of our world of inequality and racial injustice. And these are the themes that we want to interrogate today in our roles as content creators. This is the inaugural event for our Sustainable Environment Education Series and the PGA and Writers Guild of America East are pleased to host these important conversations with some pretty amazing partners. We've got the Center for Cultural Power, the Sierra Club, NRDC, Natural Resources Defense Council, and the Good Energy Project. So I'd like to introduce our participants and our moderators. We have some links to bios on our participants uh, in the chat box, but I'm gonna give a very brief introduction to get us started. I'll begin with Reverend Lennox Yearwood Jr. He's a climate leader and president and founder of the Hip Hop Caucus. He works to bridge the gap between communities of color and environmental advocacy. And he has led coalitions of organizations around themes including voter rights, Katrina survivors, and the green movement to name a few. Thank you for being with us today. We have Dorothy Fortenberry. Dorothy is a playwright and essayist and is currently in her fourth season as a writer producer on the award-winning adaptation of Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu. Craig Mazin is a Golden Globe and two-time Emmy award-winning writer and creator of the HBO limited series, Chernobyl. He has written many blockbuster feature films that appeal to a wide range of audiences. And he has a podcast with John August called Script Notes with over 400 episodes to date. Okay. Next we have Jihan Crowther. Jihan is a playwright, an essayist, and a TV writer for Amazon series, including The Man in the High Castle, as well as the upcoming Barry Jenkins adaptation of the Colson Whitehead book, The Underground Railroad. Her plays have been produced and developed around the world, and she is the recipient of two Alfred P. Sloan Foundation commissions. Okay, and now our moderators. Deandrea July is a freelance writer and audio producer focused on culture. Her film criticism has been published in several outlets, including the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Hollywood Reporter, and, and she's been broadcast on NPR. She's also a pre-WGA TV writer. And Anna Jane Joyner, climate activist and co-host of the podcast, No Place Like Home, Anna Jane is also founder of the Good Energy Project, which is launching soon. Good Energy will provide resources to writers and advocates for climate storytelling in TV and film. And now Anna Jane and Deandrea, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thanks Lydia. So um, we're gonna start off with um, a question about our present moment. Um, glad everyone could join us today. So as you know, we're kind of at the middle of witnessing several crises about racial injustice, global, the global pandemic, and then climate change has been ongoing. Um, and with quarantine, we're all kind of sitting in front of the TV a lot more. So um, what is something you've seen read recently that gave you courage or inspired you? And um, let's start with uh, Dorothy. Um, hi, yeah, so uh, I am sitting in front of the TV um, with my kids because um, there's no school and uh, we're all stuck in a house together. So um, the thing that I've seen recently is Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts, um, which is on Netflix. It is a really um, hopeful, strange, musical, post-apocalyptic, um, diverse, LGBTQ positive, uh, 
magical animals. Like it's got everything um, <laughs> that you want uh, in your, in your post-apocalyptic life. Um, and I've been watching that with my kids because that's how uh, I watch TV in this pandemic. Nice. Jihan? Um, I've been, I think, most inspired by, uh, most recently, I May Destroy You on um, HBO, uh, Michaela Cole's, like, extraordinary masterpiece. Um, I would say that and normal people. And I think a lot of that, which is on Hulu right now, and that's um, a lot to do with kind of the specificity and the intimacy of the storytelling for both of those. And just like the real kind of bravery, I think, especially for I May Destroy You, um, in terms of just kind of like going for it in a way that like I would love to do. <laughs> so yeah, those two. Yeah. Um, Rev, why don't you go next? Yeah, I, I've been super inspired this week because of the pipeline fights that have been happening and we've been winning. And so we won on, and a lot of these I got, I got arrested for. So yeah, I have some skin in the game <laughs> in some of these situations, but the uh, Atlantic Coast pipeline was canceled. Um, the Keystone XL pipeline was, uh, the Supreme Court held it up. And the Dakota Access Pipeline was also um, uh, temporarily suspended, which is ph phenomenal for those who were in Standing Rock. And so, you know, it just, it's just an amazing for me to, to witness that. I mean, we have a lot more work to do, a lot more pipeline fights, but to have three, not just one, but three pipelines that we've been fighting for to help us transition from fossil fuels to clean energy, man, that has me on cloud nine. And last but definitely not least, Craig. Um, thank you. I, I just want to point out, I'm, I don't live with Dorothy. It looks like we live together, but we don't. It's just <laughs> have it's just different. It's different brick. It's entirely different. We did brick. diffuse um, the scandal, Craig. That was going to be like the big reveal. <laughs> Fine. I, we I, don't I, live know, together. It's my way of doing things. I like to just get it out front. And then um, it's all downhill from here. Um, I, uh, in times of misery, I tend to find that it's comedy that connects me to the human condition sometimes more than drama. And um, Pat Oswalt, who's uh, one of the best stand-up comedians out there, has a new special on Netflix, but it's the special before that I've been listening to lately. It's called Annihilation. And it, it, it was the first special he did after his wife died. She died very unexpectedly. And so it's about grief and it's about your life being blown up. And uh, you watch him kind of process it in a funny way. And it gives you hope in general because our lives are constantly being blown up. Our collective life uh, has been uh, repeatedly blown up. And then somebody comes along and points out that there's pain and there's misery, it's all real. And on the other side is something else. So I've, I've been pretty inspired by that. Anything that gives me any vague sense of hope these days is very inspiring, so I cling to it. Mm, I love that. Deandrea, what about you? What's giving you courage and hope these days? Um, well, I'm watching a lot of content with um, infants in it. Um, so um, I've watched that Netflix docuseries about babies and all the different aspects of development. I just find it utterly fascinating and you get to see the kids basically from like birth to like age two change and it's it's really awesome yeah what about you um mine is kind of a strange one which is appropriate for the show but um i loved russian doll natasha leone and leslie headland's uh sort of dark comedy that came out last year um, but I loved it because it's this like metaphor for being stuck in the deathly loop cycle of addiction and I as a climate activist really saw that kicked in beyond sort of personal our collective addiction to fossil fuels and to all of the societal injustices, racism, inequality that have underpinned creating the climate crisis. And I also, I, I think as a climate activist, especially until recently, I have felt like, it, I, am I going crazy? Like, am, is the universe messing with me? Like, why isn't anyone else concerned about this? And so I totally related to that part of the story. 
but also I loved how they got out of it. Um, they got out of it by uh, confronting their uh, past traumas and the harms that, that was done to them. And, um, and I think there's a metaphor for confronting our society's past harms of, of racial injustice and inequality. And then also by finding others who were also concerned and experiencing the same things and working together to figure out how to get out of it, which is exactly what we're here doing today. So that's what came to mind for me. So our next question is actually for you. So I watched this brilliant film critic who has really done amazing research and work about how film and storytelling is a powerful medium for shifting culture and impacting political will for both, both better and worse. Um, I'm curious just to hear more about why do you view it, uh, film as such an important part of, of impacting our culture and, and shifting even our, our political lives? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, any significant social change always has a culture change element to it because culture is, you know, the stuff where people live and breathe and move and ideas get shaped and formed. And so if you're, let's say, um, I actually just have a piece that just went live on VanityFair.com today um, about this, um, about um, what people call the racial empathy gap, which is basically this idea that, um, white folks are not used to watching things that don't center them, um, whereas all other marginalized groups are very used to that. And obviously, we didn't have a lot of choice for most of time. Um, <laughs> so um, I think that if you can't see yourself on TV in some way, and if you also lack the ability to see yourself in people who don't look like you, um, you know, it results in a lot of invisibility. And um, I think one good example of that is this new Netflix documentary called um, Disclosure. I saw it at um, the premiere at Sundance. And um, it's an amazing film because for me as a cis person, what I really got from it was like, if you're growing up trans, not knowing that trans is a thing, because the people around you don't know that, and you've never seen anyone talk about that, when you see a representation of someone who's trans on TV, it actually lets you know that you exist. Like, there were trans people who did not know that they, you know, were a thing. There were other people like them for a long time. So um, it's not just, when we watch Pose, it's fun, it's beautiful, it's well written, but it's, um, it's not, it's, it means a lot. And um, yeah, I will let you take it, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so my next question is actually for Reverend Yearwood. And um, basically, we know that communities of color are disproportionately harmed by climate change. And you just wrote a really powerful op-ed in Shondaland um, called Climate Justice is Racial Justice. And we're also in the midst of this you know, widespread Black Lives Matter protest and a global pandemic that has really dramatic impacts on our lives and our society and especially on communities of color, um, but also the stories we can and should be telling. Um, can you share some of your thinking on why climate justice is racial justice and how this speaks to the need to tell both more climate stories, um, but perhaps even more particularly more intersectional climate stories in TV and film? No, most definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, somebody, I think, just shot out to me in a text, what does my hat say? We can't see it. So I guess let me first to say that. My, my hat today says the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. So that's one of that. That's that was Tony my... K. Dambara, by the way. I'll it just leave that in there. Uh, most yes. definitely. <laughs> I'm going to give her um, the shout out in that, in that regard. So um, and I have a lot of, so my, I have a lot of hats. So you all, you know, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> but to your point in regards to climate justice, climate justice is racial justice. There's nothing else around it. I, I do want to also say that there are many things that are happening within our climate. Clearly, the Arctic is shrinking. Clearly, the Sahara is expanding. The ocean is overheating. The forests are vanishing. Um, our seas are, are crumbling and our atmosphere now is at the highest levels of carbon in more than 20 million years. Um, but this is directly still connected to how we view each other on this planet. And so in Shondaland, and shout out to Shondaland um, for posting that article 
Um, the climate movement cannot remain silent any longer. Um, as many of you know, 15 years ago, I was a part of something that was horrific with Hurricane Katrina. And I'm actually excited that we get to, this year we're gonna be kind of reliving um, that uh, with a conference called Katrina 15. But what we have seen, the climate movement has seen more poor people and black people left behind um, in, the, in dying in the wealthiest country in the world with the act of the Hurricane Katrina and ongoing. And so there's a, there's a critical moment for us as, as artists, as creatives, as those who are trying to tell this story that we must ensure that communities of color are viewed within this story of climate justice as one. It is not separate. Climate justice is not separate from racial justice. I understand that many folks are saying, but what about police brutality? It is all in one. We must end police violence. We must end white supremacy, but we must also end the environmental injustices that many black, brown, Asian, and indigenous communities face daily. Black, brown, indigenous people are more likely to be killed by police than white people. But at the same time, black, brown, and indigenous people are also more likely to live around toxic oil and gas infrastructure from the freeways to the oil rig, which are often cited in communities of color, dangerously close to our homes, our schools, and our hospitals. And so I think that as we are dealing with this, um, the issue of climate justice being racial justice is something that this movement has not connected the dots. And I think that has had an impact on the films, on the music, which we have seen. At the Hip Hop Caucus, we were fortunate to do a climate, a climate album that was called Home. And then that we had people like Neo and Anthony Smith and Common and Crystal Waters and just so many amazing artists, most of them being people of color. When we put forth that album to the communities, the climate movement just said simply, oh, that's nice. Thank you for that album. Um, it was called Home, Heal Our Mother Earth. And they didn't really take it in. And, that, and I actually, that hurt me. I'm like, wow, we did a, we did a climate album with home, with, on these things and with, with Common and Heo and all these great artists. And the larger climate movement didn't take it in. But what I realized, the climate movement had its own culture as well. I like to say it's kind of Birkenstock. And so they have their own culture in that regard. And so in that, um, we had, we, had to, we had to realize that while climate justice is racial justice, the climate movement has its own culture that excludes racial justice or excludes the understanding of racial justice and what it means to, to deal with that. So I think the more that we can connect those dots um, and understand what that means, then the better we can for our people. That's great, yeah. Um... Totally, I'm glad you started the conversation off with that. Um, we're gonna shift a little bit over to Craig. Um, I have a question for you about, um, we've heard you say, talk about this concept of the broken brain that like really complex issues like climate change, even as we're seeing with COVID, um, you know, racism and other social injustices are really hard for just the human brain to kind of take in the fullness of it. And they're also hard to translate visually. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, this is slightly pessimistic, but I'll try and end on a hopeful note. Um, we're just not rational. We think we are. Uh, everything that we do um, when we're advocating things and listening to Rev Yearwood, I mean, he's talking about plans. Like he's, they have thoughtful plans. And the enemy of thoughtful plans turns out to be the human brain because the things that we know are correct run into faulty wiring in the way human beings process information. And one of the simplest problems that we have, and one of the most robust, consistent problems we have is dealing with things we cannot see. So you can't see radiation, right? So that's what our show is about. You cannot see climate change. You can't see it. Even when you show people charts, you're showing them a representation of something that they can't see. Too much time is going by. They cannot see it in the moment. You can't see COVID. And when we can't see things, we have trouble believing that they're true, even when a million people tell you that it's true. 
Here's another thing that until kind of recently, we collectively as a nation weren't seeing. And when I say collectively, really what I mean is white people. And that is police brutality. We, I was talking with somebody about how the, the Rodney King uh, beating that happened in 1992, at least the tape came out in 1992, was shocking because it was caught on video and video at the time was kind of hard to get. You had a thing on your shoulder. <laughs> a lot of people, I didn't have a video camera in 1992. We all have a video camera now. The difference that we're seeing now, I think, honestly, in the way America is starting to come to grips with a problem that has always been there consistently is that we can see it. So when we talk about climate change and we talk about racial justice and any kind of social justice issue, the, the problem that we are constantly confronting is that people don't know how to process something they cannot see right in front of them. And particularly if that thing is something that makes them uncomfortable, right? Then they have a hundred reasons to not believe it. So part of the job that we have as artists um, is to figure out how to show them. I, mean, I believe this is kind of the path. Figure out how to show them something that has happened that they can see. There was a conclusion to it. Chernobyl happened, it concluded. If you try and make a show about Chernobyl in the middle of Chernobyl, there are gonna to be too many people saying it's not that bad. And let's argue over what's true or not. And who can even say what's true? And we end up in the situation that we feel like we're in all the time right now. Um, but if there's a historical event that occurred, happened, concluded, and there's no question about what happened, like the Titanic sank, right? They couldn't see the iceberg, so they didn't believe in the iceberg until they hit the iceberg. But we know they hit it because it happened. So a lot of what we have to think about as artists is how can we take a problem that is right now, like climate change, that our brains are not very good at handling and processing, and analogize it to something that has happened that we can process and say, guys, do you not see? It's happening again right now. It's just that you're, you're one of those idiots in the beginning of the, of the show or the movie that doesn't believe it. So don't be that idiot. Be the smart one that does believe it and then deal with it Bef unless you want to live through the tragedy of the movie or television series we just showed you. That's it. I just killed the conversation. It's over. Oh, no, no. Beandre, I think the next question is yours. Is that right? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, tech problem. All right. Oh, yes. All yeah. right. <laughs> Different drafts here. Real, real people doing real things. Um, okay. So, yeah, I'm going to take it out to um, Dorothy. Oops. I think you're muted again. Wait, hold on just one second. I'm having like a little bit of a tech snafu. Hold on one second. Okay. Yeah, so um, this question is actually for Jihan, pardon me. Um, so we know that you have worked on some great TV shows, um, Barry Jenkins Underground Railroad and also The High Man in the High Castle. And um, this question is about storytelling structure. So you know, as you're well aware, um, the hero's journey, the sort of savior's um, story is kind of the guiding structure for storytelling, I would say in Hollywood um, and in Western civilization. And I wonder if you've thought about um, alternative story structures and what that can bring to elevating climate change to the level of emergency that it actually is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the sort of savior structure narrative, which is really um, a white savior narrative, we're going to be real about it, is um, is a, a way that things have been done in the past. And I think what happens with that is you're limited by a person who, you're kind of bound to this character who knows the least about something and ultimately learns the least about something because it doesn't sort of necessarily affect them directly. And so I think a way to kind of um, look beyond that is to really think about the people who are the characters who would be most directly affected by whatever is happening in that community and really kind of zeroing in on those people. Um, I think a lot about like whenever the 
Flint, Michigan water crisis movie is made, like I'm not going to be at all interested in the head of the utility company learning some a lesson and their journey towards like understanding that everybody deserves clean water. Like I want to know about the people who, you know, make their Thanksgiving dinner using bottles and bottles and cases and cases of water who children who have never had a been able to like open a tap and have a clean glass of water, which is something we just would take for granted. Like, we, and we should all be able to take that for granted. And I think those stories are the stories that are of interest to me, certainly. And I think um, a perspective that we don't get to see when we're looking at kind of the, these sort of bigger stories. I think there's a tendency to tell a story kind of message first and not character first, which is the way that I like to um, experience anything and the way that I like to write. And I think that if we kind of focus on those people and those stories and like the reality of those stories, like real people and just sort of telling the truth of their lives. And we have something that is um, a bit more real and more direct because I think there's like, there's a vast gap between kind of the day-to-day -day life leading towards like the day after tomorrow, which is a movie that I enjoy. I enjoy a disaster movie, I enjoy an action movie, but there are lots of um, little deaths on the way to that, right? On the way to the major disaster. I think when people think of climate change, they think of like um, major disasters and they have happened like Katrina, like the Revan was speaking about. And it's, it's something that I think people who weren't there look at and see and maybe aren't um, don't feel as connected to and I think something that we can do in stories is sort of show like that um, the people who are actually impacted what their day-to-day -day lives look like and I think um, that is a way of addressing climate change that feels um, more grounded and more real and more part of their lives and I think there is for me like it just I, I use the example of um, people um, making Thanksgiving dinner using bottles of water. And that's just me following activists on Twitter and like learning that that's what their life is. And you just can't, they're just things that you can't imagine and like things that you um, think that you know. And if you were to sort of investigate those people and those stories, you would actually learn something real about how they get by and how they're ignored and the frustrations. I can't imagine year after year after year and everybody knowing this is like a crisis and it's not just when it's so many communities in the US and not and feeling like people are forgotten or they don't care or they know and don't care, which must be devastating beyond belief. But I think that's that way in to a story is um, a way that I'd like to see done. I could yeah. just add, I, I, I'm sorry, I just want to say that one thing that Gian brought up that's really important is that we do process stories through characters. We, we don't process them them through messages. The message is the, it's like when you're trying to give your dog a pill, that's the pill. And then the characters are sort of like the thing you stick it in, um, like the cheese, but uh, specifically relationships are how we process stories. And that is part of the art and craft of what we do is to actually take advantage of the fact that our brains don't work right. Our brains overemphasize relationship and people because that's how we function in life. So it's important that as we go about telling these stories and if we have a message, we don't go down the path of ax grinding, which is boring because that's how it works. I mean, it's amazing to say, but if you're explaining something to somebody that might save their life and you're boring, they won't listen to you. It's crazy. If you say something to somebody that might ruin their life, but you're fascinating, they will listen to you. So we have a responsibility to use our powers for good because they are powers. And part of that is presenting things through the lens of relationships and characters that people can understand, accept, identify with and empathize with. Oh yeah, I, I think that you're right. You just, um, you and Gian both just like, that is the key is, is telling stories through the characters and relationships. Dorothy, I think you wanted to say something about this too. Yeah, um, absolutely. I just wanted to follow up on um, points that Jihana and Craig were both making, um, which is some of it is also about gatekeepers and whose stories get told when. I think there's this idea that like they're just not there, but like 
they are. Um, and I, you know, you can look at, you know, Octavia Butler is a black woman in the 1980s writing powerful character driven stories about climate. She's reading Bill McKibben. She is, you know, creating a layered, beautiful imaginary world that grapples with how California would handle extreme weather events. And we have 92 different Star Wars pieces of content and her works are not yet on screen. Like there, there's a night, there are the people who are already doing the storytelling and there are the people who determine what ends up on your TV and movie experiences. And uh, I think part of what we have to talk about is, is gatekeeping, is who's, who's letting who tell what story uh, on what terms. Um, and and who is getting you know a million different chances to tell slightly different versions of the same old thing? This is Rev. I guess one of the things I just want to add to that because I just I, I love this train of thought. It's such an important part of the conversation with the gatekeepers and how the story is being told. I think it's also important to how the story is, is being told who are the gatekeepers, but then in whose perspective and how and what through what culture. And um, we saw like The Wire was very, a very, you know, successful and powerful, um, you know, uh, you know, series to about Baltimore. I mean, maybe people, probably, people won't see Baltimore the same way again. Um, but I think if you can imagine us telling the, our story of the issue of the climate justice and, and climate change through that same lens of the wire. I think it's also important so that we can so that we can connect the dots so that more folk people can actually be can be brought into this movement, but also can understand what we're going through. I think that's one thing that Craig mentioned is very important, which is that, you know, it's how we're telling the story and how it's being laid out. But I think it's also in the in the display and, and how it's connecting with the community. For for example, I think you know we we've been working on some projects around that, but it's it's important that we connect it so that it it comes from the community. So for instance, like issues of police brutality and climate change is an example. We know, for instance, the issue that is the story of climate change is really told, told from the, uh, the polar bears and is told from the Arctic and is told from, you know, uh, different kind of ways of nature. But if you begin to connect the dots, for instance, Eric Garner, who said he couldn't breathe, and you connect the dot that Eric Garner lived in New York City in a borough that received an F for, air, F for air quality. At the same time, everyone in his family, including his daughter who would later pass, Erica Garner, because of asthma, um, you have a situation here where then you see that not only is the police choking at community, but also those who are putting forth the pollution. And you begin to tell that story from that community, from the Bronx, from the boroughs, and the culture that comes from that aspect, climate change and the story of what we normally tell looks completely different. That's what I was kind of saying earlier about the culture. I think people who have been telling the story tell it from either the East Coast or the West Coast, tell it from Sonoma County or Vermont. They're not telling the story from Flint. They're not telling the story from Newark. That must change. Mm, well, coming to you from the Gulf Coast of Alabama, where I think activists, we, and if not many more uh, compelling climate stories across this country in places you wouldn't expect. Um, and we, one of the resources we'll be talking about later is trying to help writers and showmakers and, and creators connect with more people in those spaces um, for inspiration and for uh, wisdom on how to tell those kinds of stories. But speaking of this, um, speaking of this kind of uh, topic, um, Beandre, I'm gonna go back to you for our next question, which is very related. Oh, you're on mute again. Sorry. <laughs> so easy. Okay. I have um, this question is for Dorothy. Um, so you work in the Handmaid's Tale writers room, and you have since the beginning. So um, I'm wondering if you can talk about um, how climate factors into you creating the storylines on your show, and um, kind of what you've learned about climate storytelling from working on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, climate became a part of our conversation from the very beginning um, because we were 
bringing uh, Margaret Atwood's book, which came out in 1986, uh, 30 years into the future. Um, and so her book, there is an environmental theme. Um, there is some sort of global environmental event that is interfering with fertility. But the implication in the novel is that it's probably like nuclear and it's about um, nuclear waste and uh, pollution in the way that I think someone in 1986 would have framed the most urgent threat see also Chernobyl, um, that this is, this is the thing that will, is gonna ruin us, um, is, is nukes gone awry. Um, working on it in the summer of 2016, uh, it seemed clear that the global uh, environmental event that was going to have long lasting health consequences uh, was gonna be climate change. Um, so we, we knew that was uh, in the background um, and, I think the most important decision that we made was that um, climate change is, it's an event, it's not an opinion. Um, and as such, it is available to anybody to mobilize. Um, it doesn't have a politics associated with it inherently. Um, so what we created was a world where the standard American government was faced with an enormous challenge it did not meet it. It had it, you know, it was it was not capable of rising to address this challenge. And so a group of uh, armed fanatics killed everybody, took over, and started to address it. Um, and I I don't think our show is uh, sympathetic to you know the people in charge of Gilead, um, but I do think it says look, if, if the standard systems won't fix a problem, then non-standard systems will emerge. Um, and, and that is one reason why it would be really good if standard systems did fix problems. Um, and we, we made the decision that um, all of the Gilead people would drive electric vehicles, we would see solar panels, um, there'd be no plastics. Um, it's a world of, you know, everything is is reused. Um, it's a world without uh, trying to really eliminate waste. Everything's organic. Um, and and that was really important because um, we wanted to show that you could have a, a system that was all natural um, and that could have some pretty um, negative and, and horrifying uh, points of view as well. Um, and then in how we, how we talk about it, you know, I think we also want to show that thing was that Craig was getting at where where things are invisible. So it's 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 subtle. You know, none of our characters are climate activists. Um, they're just regular people who notice that like, oh, it used to freeze in the winter and now it doesn't. Or like, huh, there didn't used to be this kind of insect here, but hmm, I guess now we have mosquitoes. Like it's these these changes that are emerging that you pick up on, you do you do see the effects, but you're living your daily life, you're trying to like flirt with somebody and the effects of climate change are just sort of a speed bump um, until they're not. Right, right. Yeah, it'd be, in it'd be interesting if we had like a psychological perspective here of like, if like all of the primetime shows that if people still watch appointment TV, um, I personally don't, but, um, <laughs> Uh, if all of them switched to no plastics, just that one thing, what would be the effect of that? Like, would people notice? Would it, um, without, because I love the point that Craig made about how people don't respond to preaching. And, um, you know, I think that would be, might be a fun experiment. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so let's turn back to um, Jihan. Um, do I have that right, Anna Jane? I'd love to ask a follow-up one and then back okay, to Okay, great. Yeah. Please do. Um, just on what you were just mentioning, Dorothy, um, we have like a lot of the climate stories. First of all, like just the people on this panel are the one of the few thinking about climate stories. Last time we checked, it was something like 1% of films and TV shows had addressed climate change at all, like even in mentions. Um, I think that's beginning to change with the last season we saw more of it and hopefully we'll just keep it keep that ball growing bigger and bigger and, and um, that's the goal of good energy and I know a lot of our kind of collective efforts here. Um, but something that you just spoke to, um, you know, we're kind of having this conversation about the big picture stories. but. 
and that's what we've seen a lot of in climate telling is disaster films, apocalypse porn, you know, those kind of moments of, of, of climate impact. Um, but there is so much more about how it touches our everyday lives and how do you make that entertaining? The, the scenes that you just mentioned for Handmaid's Tale are, I think are great, but just like, you know, little things like I used to see a lot more fireflies when I was little, uh, couples having very real conversations about whether or not to have kids in this era. Um, you know, the sense of anticipatory loss and kind of pervasive climate anxiety and sometimes even despair, basically the emotional, psychological and mental health impacts. Like how do we capture that in an enter entertaining way? Yeah, I mean, I think it really gets back to um, this idea of grief and loss um, that we, and this is, you know, as relevant to COVID, it's as relevant to, you know, police killing people, that there is just this tremendous amount of grief that we have to carry for death and absence and absence that was preventable, you know, absence that if people had made more humane choices, we wouldn't have to bear the weight of this loss. Um, and I, I think for me, I think it gets to relationships um, and it gets to just telling stories of people trying to grapple with, with that sadness. So it's, you know, it's a grandfather telling his grandson that the pond used to freeze in the winter. And when he was a kid, he ice skated on it. And when his grandfather was a kid, they ice skated on it. And now there's no ice skating. And that is not, that doesn't feel as catastrophic, right? As a whole city getting a tsunami on it but it is a loss. It's a grandfather telling a child that he remembers when, you know, the air was breathable and now, you know, the kids are inside and they can't go out inside and play because, you know, they're the, you know, the city has been constructed by people who made conscious choices to allow there to be pollution where they live. So I think it's trying to build relationships and characters that you care about. So what you want is, you know, you just want that kid to have a nice winter break, you know, and you've constructed a story so where you're rooting for, for somebody. And then you realize that the climate change is the impediment and is what is, it's the bad guy. It's not letting, you know, this family have the experience that they, they want to have. And then all of a sudden you've made it real and personal. Um, and it's not, it's not some abstract thing. It's, it's a very, very active um, event. But, but I think we, ha and we have to just sit with that sadness. Like we can't begin to tell these stories and we can't begin to imagine ways of telling these stories if we don't allow ourselves just to hold a tremendous amount of loss um, somewhere in our souls. The challenge, yeah, right, is that we're, we're asking people to confront their mortality. That's why this is hard. Do you know how many smokers there are on the planet still? One billion human beings still smoke. Nobody doesn't know what smoking does, right? Nobody. So you're dealing with a species that still does that stuff because the, in, on some level, they don't really believe it's gonna get them. We struggle with our own mortality and we struggle with confronting it. It's our primal fear. It's the thing that they're most afraid of is dying. And so what we're telling people is you have to be afraid uh, that you're gonna die. It's very hard to do. Um, it's hard to do, especially when you're saying uh, one day, or actually you might die when you're super duper old and that's no big deal because you're not yet old, so you don't worry about it, um, but your kids might die. It's so difficult to get people to confront their own mortality. And so part of what we have to consider as we're telling these stories is how to short circuit that. And um, part of that is getting to this kind of uh, slow, frustrating, long-term cultural campaign that will slowly turn this ship. I, I, I have no delusion that there is a magic artistic bullet. There isn't. Uh, it took decades to slowly convince Americans to stop smoking. There are obviously many Americans who still do, but way fewer than used to, way fewer. Um, not the case in China, not the case in India, not the case in a lot of uh, uh, emerging countries. Um, and hopefully people will come along. Same thing with this. It is going to take so much and it's going to take a long time. And we have to make peace with the fact that the climate will be injured as we go along. That's gonna happen, right? I mean, 
anybody that still thinks that suddenly tomorrow everyone's going to wake up and go, oh, okay, mm -mm. right? So let's price some of that in and then do the work anyway, because we need to. And it's going to take time and we're going to have to attack it from 50 different angles, the subtle and then the drastic. There's no one answer. And I, I think just to say something else to sort of tie some of these threads together, I think until we <clears throat> have a sense that all people are people, right? Like it's getting back to what you were saying, Andrea, about like, why don't white people watch shows with, you know, non-white protagonists? What is the sort of, why don't white doctors understand that black patients experience pain? You know, what, there's this gap of, you're not really a person, you know, which is why the environmental movement focused on polar bears instead of black people and brown people, because they thought white people would care more about polar bears than their fellow citizens. And I bet they were right. And it makes me insane. You know, <laughs> the idea that we, so many of these crises are hitting people disproportionately. I mean, the COVID numbers are incredibly clear. It doesn't matter what state it is. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities are getting wiped out by this invisible virus that, you know, is being racist because it's operating within a structure that racism built. So I do feel like we have to understand that people in this country, people in any country, you know, anybody who's getting affected by climate change is a human being and their loss of their family member, of their farm, of their, you know, neighborhood, whatever it is, is as real and as powerful as it would be to, you know, somebody who lives in the room next door to you. And we, we are still struggling with that. And we still have to create storytelling tools that address that. Um, but the issues are, are inevitably and inextricably linked. Can I add something to that? I think it's that I just so a couple of things. So I think this is one of the reasons why just to change how the framework of how the climate crisis is looked at is important. Um, as I, I'm from Louisiana and, and not in New Orleans. We have, we, we do funerals differently. If you've ever seen the second line or, or, or a, 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 a New Orleans funeral, you will see if you say, wow, that's a, that's a wild scene. And it may be to you, but we have a different going home service and celebration for death. And so I'd say that because even as we're approaching this, I kind of want us to say as writers, as artists, as producers, I think that we've taken the climate movement's narrative and we as writers need to get a new narrative of how we are looking at this crisis. I think we've taken how they've seen it from a very dark position a very, um, a position where the world's gonna end. And I think that part of that, to be honest, is that the climate movement, again, being predominantly white, or Birkenstock in, in this case, in a situation where they are also dealing with losing their privilege. Part of the climate crisis, one of the things I'll say that, I know Al Gore did his inconvenient truth, but the least convenient truth is climate change and white supremacy. And so one of the things I wanted to deal with that is that we have to understand that when we people are dealing with the issues of, of police brutality and Black Lives Matter and climate change, so they're from losing their privilege. And so what we need to refocus that and change it up so that the actual climate crisis is opportunity to redo things, to now get, to, to create one, have clean air and clean water so that People's zip codes don't matter that they're gonna have a, a shorter life or new jobs or green jobs or, so it's a, it's a different way of looking at it. But I think that the climate movement, and as you put it so well, Dorothy, I think that they, they, they intentionally went to the polar bear and not to the people in the community because they didn't want to lift that up. And so I think that we as writers and storytellers have to now take back the narrative and say, you know what, maybe what they gave us maybe the facts and the science are still there and they're still accurate and we're still dealing with a timetable for us where we can fix this problem but maybe how they how they looked at it from our creative standpoint we must change that and i think that that must change from our writers rooms who's in those writers rooms obviously um how we're how we're producing and where the story is being centered that to me will help us because we just follow the narrative of to be honest climate organizations I've been doing this for 50 years, that may not be the, the way that it could be told today. Yeah, I, I, all of the claps, 
All of the claps. Um, I just everything you said, I agree with so much. And also, like, I mean, I'm sorry, I know environmental organizations are sponsoring this panel, and I'm not like coming to your house personally, but like every piece of information about climate has been known since the mid 70s. And it has only gotten worse. Like if you wanna do a graph of like the change over time, like this is not new, the, the, like the graphs have been there since the seventies. And I think, you know, climate movement has to recognize that like what it has done up to this point has not been successful. And the people who have been leading and have been framing have failed and need to get out of the way and let, you know, communities and let youth and yet people who know what they're talking about and know how to do this take over because it is not like the old leaders have brought us to this point, which is a point of failure. And and it is time for people who all actually- the, All the claps for that. The, <laughs> you know, like it's, <laughs> it's not great. It's not great. And it's time for a new storytelling and it's time for new leadership and it's time for people who know who know how to do this. I, I just want to say a, another TV show that I think about a lot with climate is um, called The Midwife, uh, which is because it's set- in a time period where there has been enormous loss. It's right after World War II, everyone is dealing with loss. There's rationing, things are scarce. Um, and it's about communities. It's about people working in collective. You know, It's not a hero story, it's a community of women. It's uh, people of faith, people not of faith, people living with people of you know, similar socioeconomic background and non-similar socioeconomic background. They're, they're living in community together, figuring out how to bring babies into the world and how to treat the babies well and let them grow up well. And it has a kind of um, hope without being, you know, hokey. And it has a real relationship to like people connecting horizontally and, and with each other and not just like going out as the lone guy with the, you know, superhero cape and saving the world. And I think that's the kind of storytelling we could use a lot more of around climate. Mm, yeah, I absolutely love that. I think you guys are just preaching to my soul, but also to the writers and the industry and the stories we need to be telling because it is such a complex and collective problem that does impact um, vulnerable communities. Like we really do need to to really kind of um, invite new storytellers and more diverse story storytellers to the table. And I loved what both Rev and Craig were saying about how this idea of, of moving through grief and pain, I think it's such an American thing to view, to view that as dark and death is super scary and change and loss is super scary, but there's actually this kind of rebirth that can happen and even beauty and joy that you can find in it. It's also real pain and fear, um, but that also share some sort of hope about the world we could build and um, what we, you know, how we can have, find healing in all of this. So I want to actually talk to <laughs> Jihan um, about that. Hey, hey. Hey, one quick thing, sorry, just to um, sort of conversation was just happening, which is, um, I think when we talk about sort of um, environmental justice and like sort of white supremacy and just along the lines of what Rev and Dorothy were talking about, I think a lot of what we are talking about too is like, um, yes, seeing people as full people, but also there are decisions being made about who deserves to live, right? And so whether or not they're a person or not is almost irrelevant because if we think about COVID and where it's like everybody locked down and then when like, the realization was most of the people who are dying were black and brown people, it was like, I guess we can open. I think it'll be fine because those people don't deserve to live or if they do, good luck because I do need like my nails done or whatever, I need a drink at a bar. And so I think that's something that is um, a real problem to be addressed. And I think it can be addressed in storytelling, but when we come to our industry, our, the issue is whose stories deserve to be told, right? And so that goes back to a lot of what Dorothy was saying about gatekeepers, because over and over, there are people whose stories, they wanna tell their stories and you're told no, because will white people like it or will people feel offended or all, all these other, um, it's sort of over consideration of the white gaze that happens a lot that makes these stories difficult to tell. And if they are being told, then it's like a room full of like white dudes telling it. I love The Wire too, but that was what that room was. And so I think there's just, um, there are so many layers of things that they all work together is really what I'm trying to sort of say. And so when we are thinking about who deserves to live, what we're also seeing in our interesting things that can be done here is like whose stories deserve to be told and how can we facilitate those stories being told so that 
it all, all sort of works together and becomes clear. Like everyone obviously deserves to live and everyone deserves to have their stories told and not just from the one perspective over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, I think that's a whole second panel we could definitely do. Like not just uh, what are new narratives that we should be telling, but like how do we get these stories to screen? Um, so yeah, that is definitely something I personally want to dig a lot deeper on and something that is very, very critical to telling better and more and more diverse climate stories. Um, Jihan, I'd love to ask you, you do have this amazing experience, it, like you know, tackling systemic injustices like racism, racism in your work at both The Man in the High Castle and now The Underground Railroad. What do you think that writers can learn um, you know, trying to incorporate the systematic injustice of the movement entertaining that people want to watch um, from the work that you've done and the experience you've had? Great. Some of it cut out, but you're asking what um, writers can learn about people who in incorporate injustice into their work. Is that the question? Yeah, basically. Yeah, based on your from that. yeah um, I think there are several things to learn. I think it goes. I think everything goes back to um, sort of character first, but also this is also where like diversity is our friend and um, as it is in all things. And by diversity, I, of course, we talk a lot about race, but I'm also thinking in terms of class and all of the different ways that we live within systems and how that affects us. And so with, um, I'll just use like the Man in the High Castle, our season four as an example, which is there was like an understanding of there being like a rebellion um, led by Juliana, our main sort of female character. And in this um, most recent season is where we sort of learned essentially what happened to the black people um, and other people of color within um, that world. And so that, how we sort of told the story of that injustice was through um, the BCR and like a, a character named Belle Mallory who was kind of um, emerged as a leader in that group. And it sort of showed how um, sort of black Americans were living under the sort of Japanese controlled area of the US and that, and the reason we of course couldn't show what was happening in the um, right just because there had been um, a very complete genocide as you can sort of see, there's not a Italian person even um, on that side of the, the, the country um, in that world. And I think um, how we told that story was just the facts of their lives. And I think it just sort of goes back to create real characters that are true and then tell the truth and tell the truth of their lives. And that is within those systems, that's all you need to do, like to see how Bell can get from one section to another and it's essentially an apartheid state, which is I think a thing that we weren't, that wasn't as clear um, because we were dealing with sort of characters that were only um, sort of white navigating those systems. And so seeing like the extra steps she has to go through just to get to her job and that just gives a fuller view of what that world is. And I think what a lot of what we've been talking about, about just sort of showing people's lives and how it's impacted by the systems in which they live and the world in which they live is, is really not all you need to do, but a lot of what you need to do. So it's not blowing it up into um, in just sort of like an issue point. It's just how they live within that system um, shows like the depravity of that system. It shows the weaknesses of um, the people who are oppressing. It shows all of the things that we want to know about um, how people work and live and exist. Um, and I think the thing that really, I think brought home what the rebellion was fighting for and against was brought home through like these black characters because there is that extra layer that the white characters just didn't have to deal with for three seasons before we sort of came around finally to um, the black and brown people in those communities. That's so fascinating. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Hollywood is always talking about we want fresh and interesting stories. We want things we haven't seen before, you know, and a lot of the climate stories and of course there's big crossover with other marginalized groups in that as we well discussed here. Um, yeah. Those are fresh, extremely fresh stories. I mean, um, we literally have never seen them. We haven't often thought about them yet. So um, I think that there's a um, big room for people to open their minds and see what's possible around inserting climate. Um, I also would just say quickly that um, if you watch Queer Eye, and I've been promoting Netflix all, I have no, no ties to Netflix, but um, they had a whole episode following a climate activist from the Sunrise Movement. 
Um, and it was in Philadelphia at the Sunrise House um, where all the teens like lived and organized and worked. And I thought that was an interesting way of like talking about climate change without talking about it. And um, I'd like to see more reality shows do that, but also like, you know, I think, I think Craig's point is well taken. Like if we can just normalize it without preaching about it, you know, it's, that's, I think a big first but small step, so. Okay, so, so yeah, go ahead. More things to that. No, like, jump in, jump in. We sort of can't, like it's hard to talk about like what stories are being told without talking about the makeup of the writer's rooms, right? So I think what becomes essential is adding a diversity of people to the writer's room and not just like other black people who went to Harvard, but like just truly like a variety of like thought and a variety of um, experiences because, um, and I don't know, I might be speaking out of school, but Amazon can call me on if they want to. But, um, you know, with High Castle, I was like one of the, uh, me and another writer were the first black people in that room. It just been like a bunch of white dudes to that point and maybe a couple of like white ladies. And that's like bonkers when you think about like the scale of that show. And like, and that's, but that's also of its time, like the way that like rooms were being um, put together and certainly still are to an extent. But I think adding me and there's like another um, black writer who, we could kind of bring um, something extra and we weren't hired. I think also it's important to say that we weren't hired just because we're black writers and just here to talk about the black stories, which is we can have a whole other um, panel about talking to showrunners about not doing that. But um, I think there is uh, just adding like the, the, all the value add that, that increases when you add people of different ages, of different classes, of different races in the room. It really creates like a much more fuller, juicier story. And I think um, our, our season was probably the best season and I'm coming from it as somebody who was like a huge fan of the show. Like, and I loved each season. Like I couldn't even believe I got staffed on that show. I was like weeping, I was like so excited. So I, but I think because we got to tell like a richer story. It wasn't just the white people on one side of the country and the white people on another side of the country who were being oppressed by Japanese people. It was just like everybody, as many people as we could sort of um, add to that mix that I think created something that felt really kind of exciting and new, even within a story that like everyone thought they knew because this was like the fourth season. And it sort of, um, I think, but it, it it required a room that was diverse and showrunners who valued the writers that they hired. And that right. is like the, the real key. Yeah, and I think that's definitely one of the takeaways from this conversation. And it's, it feels like an old conversation, but also a new conversation. Like we've been in beta, now we're in like 2.0, but it's still kind of the same conversation. Um, and just the intersection of great storytelling with having diverse rooms, with having people who value that the climate crisis is important to talk about, with um, you know new doors opening, new projects being greenlit, and people's voices that haven't been heard, like from the black and brown people who've been leading the efforts on climate change, you know, being part of the story as well. So um, I hope people are taking notes um, and, and thinking about how they can um, use what we've been talking here in a practical way in their positions of power that they have. And um, we're going to go ahead and just move to Q&A. Oh, and I wanted to say, I wanted to um, say um, Script Notes had a great episode that went into depth with the, um, the Black uh, Committee, Black Writers Committee of the WGA. It was the June 30th episode that Craig and John hosted the great podcast Script Notes, um, where they went into detail about a lot of the things that we've talked about. So if you're somebody who needs to hear those arguments, go listen to that. Um, all right. So thanks for bearing with us. We have um, a great crew of people on here and we're ready to take questions. So let me get us started with that. Actually, Biandra, while you're identifying the top two questions, can I ask one more question for the panel? You're a co-moderator, go ahead. <laughs> okay, cool. I just wanted to tie it back to kind of these intersecting themes. So we know that we have very little time within a decade to um, to make you know to avert the worst impacts of climate, um, but we have seen since COVID this sort of huge collective, quick, decisive action, where both individuals and governments are overhauling how we do our lives, um, you know the norms of our lives. All for uh, the at least outside of the United States, we haven't been doing that very much lately. We were at the beginning, 
Um, but I just, I'm curious how you think that this moment of, of great societal change um, could provide potential for urgent collective action on climate change and how we kind of reimagine what this new world we can live in is in bold ways. And how does that influence the, the kinds of stories that we tell in TV and film? And that is an open question. So um, if whoever would like to speak to it, please jump in. Let me just follow the last question, um, then from then moved it to that question. So I just wanted to say that along with the diverse um, writers rooms, um, I think that we need to have the funding of these projects. That's also very important. Um, we at the Hip Hop Caucus were very fortunate to be funded for a project to create a writers room that we can create diversity. Um, we actually were creating a, a comedy um, that was around climate. Again, finding funny in this process. And so I think that's what we did. And we did that with our project called Ancient Mama's Heat Wave. And I just want to bring it up why it's important because we were able to bring on different writers into that room who may not have been climate experts, but we were able to be very patient. In other words, to be like certain communities may not come from this conversation about um, you know, how much carbon is in the atmosphere and, and mountaintop removal and fracking and whatever else may be the case, but they understand it. But once they can get into the writer's room, because they're obviously brilliant writers, um, they can get it quickly. So I just wanted to kind of just bring that up, but then they had to have the folks who actually were funded to do the projects could actually have enough, could do it with those writers. So I just make sure both of those go together. To, to your point, um, to, to linking these things together, I think what you're saying, um, you know, for, for me, that, that the issue of what we're trying to do and we're about creating a better world is simply what we're talking about, about how we treat each other. Um, this movement has to be about black, white, brown, red, male, female, straight, gay, theist, atheist, human. This must be a human movement that puts humanity first. And in that process, by doing that, I think that then we'll begin to see the kind of world that we want to live in, see about how we begin to treat each other, the kind of extractive colonial kind of mentality, which has been the fossil fuel industry that has got us to this point now, is what needs to change. And if we can get away from that extractive, usatory um, mentality, um, then we can begin to see big change within our, in our, in our, in our climate in our environment, but also how we treat each other as people. Great, great. Okay, um, I'm back, sorry about that. Um, I literally have not had any internet downage, outages in quarantine except for today. So that's just how life works. Um, okay, <laughs> so let's get into uh, some questions here. Um, do we need to see, quote, the solution and what a climate safe future would look like rather than see only quote the problem, finding a way to make the solutions as interesting for the big screen as the disasters are? Yeah, I think this is the this is a Star Trek question, right? Like we we now have been telling dystopias um, for a while in this century. And we I think the thing about a dystopia is it skips the hard part. So if we pick up after the bad thing has happened and we're only sifting through the wreckage, in some way, what we do is we're letting ourselves off the hook because the chaos and all of the loss seems inevitable. <clears throat> so I think Walking Dead is a climate show, right? Like I think the reason that our, our collective unconscious made that the most popular show in America is because people could tell that something was coming that was going to change their whole ways of life um, and they're afraid of it, but they also didn't really want to change it. So living after, um, is this kind of self-letting off the hook. And I think um, something like Star Trek is a show where the biggest problems of the day when it was being made have all been fixed. Um, you know, and so you're, you're showing people what if you have this, you know, ragtag band of people and they're all just going throughout the universe um, and, and everything's okay. What, what, would there still be drama? Would there still be conflict? And there is, you know, they have to go to all the different planets, but like stuff, stuff still happens. So I, I think we do have, um, I think the idea of telling a compelling utopia um, is really worthwhile. And I think because we're people, 
you know, there'll always be interpersonal conflict. Like, you know, there'll always be stories. People will still get crushes on the wrong people, you know, even uh, in the climate utopia. Um, but I do think um, making that take up some part of people's brains is really valuable because if the only spot in people's brains when they think about the future and climate is despair and c collapse and catastrophe, I do worry that it becomes a self-fulfilling, uh, it feels inevitable. Um, and so you might as well not do anything because you already saw how, how the book ends. Um, so I think thinking of, you know, we have the, it's not a tech, it's not a technological fix. It's a political will fix. Um, we currently have all the technology we need to be able to generate the energy that we need to be able to move away from this. So telling that story in a way that showed people what was possible, um, I think would be really exciting and valuable. Yeah, yeah, I would just repeat that, that we have everything we need technologically to address climate change, but we don't have the political will, which I think is key. Okay, here's a question about Avatar. Um, I knew we'd get there eventually. Uh, <laughs> Avatar was supposed to be an allegory for climate change, but instead of getting the message that we should protect our planet, audiences mourn that they didn't live on Pandora. This makes reaching people who avoid overt climate change content feel impossible. What are your thoughts on how to navigate this delicate dance? I feel like that's Craig's question. <laughs> well, um, Pandora kind of is, a, uh, an avatar is a slight argument against the utopia uh, theory. I mean, I think that uh, Dorothy is correct in that you do need to show people a positive outcome because if they only see negative outcomes, then they feel hopeless. Um, the problem with stories like Avatar, which are incredibly popular, is that they're so entertaining uh, and they've gone so deep into tweaking our brains with entertainment that the rest of it just seems irrelevant. Um, it seems uh, because you believe it's so much that you forget that our planet is that planet. <laughs> you forget that point and you're like, that place is awesome. And it's, look, it's also romanticizing a certain kind of anti-technology uh, perspective. It's romanticizing the past. It's romanticizing the trope of the noble savage. It's doing a lot of things that are very sort of traditional and work to obscure a kind of immediate relevance to our lives right now on our planet. Um, I think that if we are going to make climate analogies, we have to do them in a way that feels a little bit more immediate. Um, science fiction actually, I think, doesn't do this particularly well. And I love science fiction, but I think science fiction ultimately ends up entertaining us so much that we forget. Um, Star Wars is in a galaxy far, far away a long time ago, and Star Trek is many hundreds of years in the future. And, and note the arc, by the way, of Star Trek as it goes more towards fighting <laughs> over time from the original series in the 60s until now, it's just, it becomes about fighting because we love lasers. I mean, listen, we're dumb, right? So as a species, we're dumb. I'll just keep coming back to this. We are, we're stupid. Um, and so we just have to be careful that as we are disguising or um, entertainizing this uh, kind of important intellectual content that we're not doing it so well that people are like, oh my God, yeah. And then there's like the thing about climate boring. Uh, they got lasers, <laughs> they fly dragons, you know? And then at that point you start to lose touch with it and it doesn't feel immediate or real in any way, shape or form. Right, yeah. And there's actually a great follow-up question that relates to that, um, that anyone can address. Um, do the films and shows have to be as so subtle as Walking Dead or Chernobyl or Handmaid's Tale? Um, when we can start, when can we start being fully open about climate justice and racial justice? Do we need to educate the gatekeepers more? Well, that's a definite yes, but go ahead. <laughs> that's a yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'll just I'll just say that um, one um, we 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 need all kind of films and all kind of works, and I think across I mean not just in the films but also our plays for me our music that begin to address this throughout. I I, I would also say this is part of part of our casting. I and mean, when I wanted to kind of follow Craig on was that 
I agree with him on on the on the sci-fi. We're, 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 we are we are here to, we're here on that, but I think it's also in the casting. We need to have better uh, people of color, black and Indian and indigenous actors who are casted for a, another generation where they exist. I think the next world doesn't have black and brown and indigenous people in it <laughs> or on other planets. Um, so unless there's some kind, unless they're part of the other galaxy. And so I think that we need to do better and not, not casting them as a person of color, but just casting them as good actors who are people of color in that role to help shape that conversation. Um, I think we have many people I know I'm around tons from Regina Hall to Anthony Smith. I mean, I have a whole list of phenomenal black actors who are super dope, who I think would be, who would love to be casted in conversations around the issue of climate that's either subtle or more direct as far as what it means to get asthma and cancer and emphysema. What's it mean to have the flood or the wildfires or the droughts? So I think that we would, I would love to see more of that happen. Yeah, I I'm think with you. I'm with you, man. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I ab absolutely agree. And I think also it's a lot of this is thinking about audience, you know, and, and you, you know, Craig has been talking about, you know, how people are. And I think we got to think about, you know, who are, who are we trying to reach? Who subscribes to this particular platform? Who is familiar with these actors? And I think you want to reach everybody. This isn't, these are issues that impact everybody. This is not some sort of like special niche nerd hippie content. This is gonna hit everyone. And so I think it requires thinking about stories that will hit everyone. I mean, my dream climate change show is just that the last episode of Modern Family, everyone's house is on fire, mm. right? Like everyone turns in in America to watch the last episode of Modern Family. And they're like, I wonder what it's gonna be like, and then all three families are just hit with a huge raging wildfire. And they're like, oh, climate change got us. Like, it's not a show about climate change. I'd watch you, that. Right, right, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. But like you, but you, there, there's the way of, you know, putting, you know, putting the message inside, you know, the family comedy. There's the way of putting the message inside the soap. There's the way of putting the message inside the action movie. I, I don't think you have to pick and I don't think you have to rank. Um, I think you just have to think about how you tell the kind of story that you are best at telling um, and making sure that that story reflects, reflects the reality um, and makes it exciting. Uh, yeah, like the, bo I, the bold type this season has had a ton of climate content um, and it's still like, you know, sexy millennials working at a magazine just talking about climate change as their sexy millennials <laughs> working at a magazine. Like it, it hasn't changed what the show is. It's just made the show include climate. Yeah, I just want to add to that and just the idea that we really need a huge range of stories. Um, and we also don't need, I, I don't want to, people to mistake what we're saying, like everything has to be a huge climate show or series or movie. Like I think some of the most compelling climate content is when they do interweave into the world and the characters that you've already built. Um, that's oftentimes where it feels most relatable and accessible. And I personally believe that if you're writing a story that is taking place now or in the next 50 years um, or 100 years really um, in this universe, in our world, then there is, a, you know, those characters are experiencing climate impacts in some way, shape or form it's impacting their lives. So it's just getting inside their heads and figuring out how that manifests in the stories that you're telling and in the, in the characters that you're building. Um, but yeah, and I also, I just speaking quickly to what Craig was saying, I don't, you know, I'm, I feel like we, we tend to see like these super doomer apocalyptic stories and then people jump straight to the utopia. One thing I'm really interested is in the in-between, like the, the world that we're likely to get is probably, it's gonna be bad. Hopefully we'll avert the very worst impact. So where are the stories in that universe um, in the next 50 to a hundred years uh, of what people are, are seeing and struggling with? I'm super interested in that. But yes, back to you, Biandria. Yeah, this is the, Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead, jump in. I just wanted to speak to the whole um, educating the gatekeepers piece, which is, um, I don't know that that is actually a necessary thing because they, they live in the world with us, right? We all have the same information. Like, I think um, it's a matter of like gatekeepers just um, trusting storytellers to tell stories and giving opportunities to people who have those stories to tell. Um, I can't imagine. 
it's like I just think about like how hard it is just to pitch your story if I had to go in and be like oh let me tell you a little something about racial injustice and climate change before I had to like tell you what my story is I'd be like I just want to die so um and also they know so I think that it's really just that is as far as the gatekeepers are concerned like that's really all that's needed is just like say yes and give us money yeah, I think I think someone on this um, who's in the audience here needs to like call up Rev and get a meeting because he's got ideas that he's ready to pitch. It sounds like so. Um, I just want to say that. Also, um, that what Jihan just said ties in well to this, which will be our last question. Sorry if we didn't get your question, but thank you for submitting it. Um, can panelists comment on why they think it's taken so long to talk about racial justice and climate in the mainstream? Neither are new issues. Racial injustice is going back to the origins of the country and man-made climate change for roughly 100 years. I'm not going to be the one. first one to do it. You know that. You know that. <laughs> I'm not falling in that trap. I'm not falling in the white guy. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I don't know. That's like a real, like, that's, that's a question for me to every everyone who has pretended not to know or just not accepted it. I think some of it probably has a lot to do with what Craig said about the way like we can't confront a thing that we don't uh, feel or see. Um, and I think things that are happening now, I, it's, this is just like a, a wild guess, but I think it's because people aren't able to look away. And I think there's also um, the ex people are experiencing like the breakdown of their government in real time. Um, I think white people are seeing the way in which they can be, they are failed um, in ways that brown communities and black communities have always known. And so just like that feeling of, and feeling kind of um, oppressed in a way, I just think about the like, masked people who were very upset about having to wear a mask and it's like, oh my God, let me tell you about abortion. So I think um, there's just like <laughs> ways that, um, that things have become clear to, to certain people who have either not known or pretended not to know that is um that can't be turned away from because we've got nothing else to do we're all just sitting in quarantine like trying to get by and i think that um it, if you are at this stage pretending not to know you are on the outside of the conversation and everybody wants to be a part of a conversation that's just my little piece yeah i, yeah. I mean yeah I, I think absolutely i also think you know the systems are working for some people you know, just fine, right? Like a, a racist capitalist patriarchy, you know, has has winners. It has people who who come out ahead. And, you know, in two thousand, uh, both major party candidates had climate plans. The idea that you would be a major party candidate and not have a plan to address climate change and not understand that greenhouse gases have to be mitigated, like that was that was a, a cultural and political norm. Um, and you could disagree about the de details, but there was a a sort of you know bipartisan national commitment which you see in all other developed countries and non-developed countries that climate change is a real thing and that politicians should address it and the story of what happened over 20 years so that like fully half of our country you know is a part of a political party that has decided not only that like this isn't a thing but is taking steps actively to make it worse um that's the, that's people's choice you know that's that's the result of a lot of individuals making choices to get that outcome because that is an outcome that they want to have happen um it's not inevitable um it's and it's it's important for me to say only because i think we sometimes get addicted to to narratives where every year is better than the year before um and you know the arc of history is this thing that doesn't um have human participation but there are ways that the arc is going in a terrible direction um and getting worse and we gotta gotta pull it pull it back um but it, but it's against powerful forces um it's there there are people who who like how things are now and want to keep them that way or make them worse um and they have to be fought with yeah, yeah. Great. And so I'm going to toss it to, oh, go ahead, Chris. Oh, just real quick, we I just was, have a little was, bit of time left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I was just, I think the answer is simply racism. That's why. <laughs> racism. It's not hard. Okay. <laughs> it's well, racism. Well, let me add, that was really quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. <laughs> well, let me add one. This is the last piece. So let me say that first to the guy who wanted to get in contact, please go to think 
100climate.com and you can hit us up with any ideas you have in that regard. But I said this earlier, um, and I think that we as a movement within this sector of um, as producers and creatives and as a climate movement as well, the least convenient truth is that climate change and white supremacy are real. And then we have to understand that white supremacy produces disproportionate amounts of environmental pollution. And we as a movement and as creatives need to really sit down and say, are there and why has there been two different versions of environmentalism, one black, one black, one, one white, one, one indigenous, and that has to change. I think that out of this conversation, we have to figure out from wherever we sit, how do we listen to and uplift black, indigenous, people of color, voices within the creative side, writers, producers, but also in the climate from to movements. Because I think if we can do that, then we can deal with that. I understand that white fragility is a real thing. And so when we discuss with racism, that that becomes something very hard to discuss. But if we're going to beat the, the climate crisis, we have to realize that race is a tripwire for the climate movement and for our creative movement and for our productive movement. And we must cut that wire. And if we are willing to admit that there is systemic racism in this country that creates the climate crisis, then actually that is actually the solution for us to win. The actual dismantling of racism is the exact solution to beating climate change. Well put. So I'm gonna to toss it to Anna Jane to close us out. Um, Anna Jane, are you up for that? I am, always very All right. difficult to follow the rev, but thank you. I, don't, I think that was the perfect way of, of ending this conversation, which has been phenomenal. Thank you so much to all of the panelists and all of the attendees for joining us today. Um, and I just wanna say one of my favorite uh, climate journalists is David, um, David Roberts from Vox. And he likes to say that our job, anyone who is now aware of the climate crisis from whatever place of, of um, position that you're coming from, from writers, creatives, Hollywood executives, activists, people on the ground, mothers, all of us have a place and our jobs now is to make the impossible possible, uh, which is what artists do. Uh, it, we create something that didn't exist before we change the story, which change, changes our lives. And so um, another thing he, he says that I think is really impo important is that I think one thing I've run into working with a lot of writers in the past year, um, to also just interfacing with humans is that people feel like, I don't have all the expertise. I don't have all the science. You know, My crazy uncle just throws wild conspiracy theories at me whenever I bring up climate change. So I can't talk about this or write about it or take some sort of action on it. And what David Roberts says to that is like, you don't need to know the thread count on the Nazi you know, uniform to know that they're coming towards us and it's bad and we need to mobilize to fight back. So don't feel like you have to know all the little details to, to make a, a big difference. Uh, we need everyone fighting with all of their different skills and tools and creations and ideas and stories. Um, and to that end, uh, we are here to help. Um, we are here to help you. If you want to follow up on this conversation, if you want to get involved, um, one big thing, huge thanks to the PGA and the WGA and the Green Production Guide for hosting this conversation. They have so many more resources on greenproductionguide.com. They're also going to be hosting more of these webinars, both on the storytelling piece, but also on other aspects of greening the film industry. So definitely follow up, uh, follow them on social media. I think those handles are in the chat um, and check them out for lots of great information. If you're feeling really inspired right now and want to take a, a kind of a concrete action that really touches on all of these different uh, intersections, the APA has been using COVID and the coronavirus to basically uh, crowd and shadow the fact that they are currently right now rolling back all of these environmental protections of who of course uh, tend to pollute and harm communities of color the most. So if you want to take action on that right now, it'll take you one minute, um, text writers to 69866. Um, and they will also put you on a list where every other week they'll send you a climate action that literally takes a minute to do from your phone. So it's a small way to make a big difference. 
And then if you are a writer or a producer or an executive who would like to find out more information, get some support and resources, or just join a bigger community of people exploring these things, uh, Good, the Good Energy Project um, is a new consulting firm that will officially launch this summer, but we are, or later this summer, but we're offering pro bono consulting services to uh, shows and films, uh, writers, producers who want to do more climate storytelling, and that's everything from research support to connecting you with experts, connecting you with character inspirations, visiting your writers' rooms, doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, script and story consultations, really whatever you need, we are here to provide. Um, and we work with some really amazing partners who are also host of this event. So I want to shout out the Sierra Club, who has been uh, our, our seed funder and a key thought partner on, on building good energy, the Center for Cultural Power, which is an amazing organization that works with primarily artists of color, both on climate justice, but also on gender justice and immigration and other issues. Um, the NRDC, especially their Rewrite the Future program, also offers free climate or story consulting for climate storytelling. So definitely look them up if you are um, needing more support on that. And you can reach all of us by emailing goodenergystories at gmail.com. Uh, we'll put you on a mailing list for our upcoming events. Also share resources as we have them. And also if you need to send us an inquiry and, and are working on a project right now where you would like some support, please reach out to us. Um, and lastly, I'll just say we do have some like exciting events and programming launching this fall, where we'll be diving more into all these themes, uh, the intersection of the climate crisis, COVID, racial injustice, also exploring some more things on mental health and psychology and climate change, um, and also looking at building climate futures, um, the kind of the range that we talked about, not just the doom and gloom, not just the utopic, but the in-between, and how we do that in a way that is um, anti-racist and, and really focused on equality. So yeah, look us up and we're here for you. And we are just so incredibly grateful that you joined us today. And that's all. Have a good one. <laughs>